You have to suck at something before you can be good at it. Welcome to the River of Suck podcast, episode four. I am your host, Andy Reiner. River of Suck is real talk about struggles with confidence, self-doubt, and becoming the USU. My guest today is Pacifica Summers, an ecologist doing postdoc research at University of Colorado Boulder. Hi, Pacifica, and thanks for joining me for this episode. <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> I think this is a really cool podcast, and I'm really excited to be on it. I'm excited to speak with you today because you're both a scientist and an avid outdoor adventurer, and you travel for your work to remote environments, and I can imagine that it's not always easy. Yeah, that's true. There's a lot of logistics that you have to know to go to Antarctica and to plan your trip there and to plan your research so it's successful. And I would have had no idea had it not been for some good mentors. And even so, uh, we learned a lot of stuff the hard way. You have a PhD. Yes. And you're now doing research postdoc, which means... Post getting your doctorate. You don't get a job hired at a university to be a professor or otherwise you run your own lab in most cases right when you graduate. There aren't that many jobs, there's other people who are more qualified. So you get hired by a professor, they need somebody to logistically do some of the work, to physically do some of the field work, some of the analysis, some of the writing. Um, and it's still a training position, so you're also getting mentored and taught by this lab. It's kind of like residency in medicine where they might already have their oh, yeah. MD degree, but they do several years of training where they rotate around and work under different doctors. It, postdoc is really similar in that sense. And um, it's a great chance to jump into a new field and suck at something new for a while <laughs> while you have somebody to teach you. And that's what I did. And you're getting paid for doing what you love. Yes. Which is the dream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Not that like every day is just like fun and glory, but it's satisfying and it's really cool. What brought you to science in the first place? I always liked solving problems. Uh, I guess there's a couple answers. I liked solving problems and asking questions and I was encouraged in that as a kid. But also the way science is taught in school is very heavy on memorization and being able to regurgitate concepts and, and vocabulary. And I was good at that. And I think that's the wrong reason to encourage kids in science. For me, fortunately, <laughs> it worked out that I like actually like doing real science, but that's really different than science class in school. And that's something I've tried to change through some of the teaching programs that I've helped to launch. Nice. Is to have teach people how to do science, you know, how to do science, not just the products of science, the vocabulary. How did you get to ecology and microorganisms? So I, I knew I liked science, and I wanted to go into science, and I wanted I knew I liked being outdoors. And in about sixth grade, I read Jane Goodall's book in the Shadow of Man, and I thought, okay, being a field biologist is the way to get to do science and be outdoors. And so I pursued field biology, which was often ecology, which is studying how organisms interact with their environment and each other. Mm -hmm. And I think if I had taken a good class in geology earlier, I could have been swayed to be a geologist instead because <laughs> they do cool field work too. But as it turned out, um, I really like biology, so worked out and i get to work with geologists now and, and collaborate with oh, them yeah. so they're down there in antarctica too yeah there's there's a lot of geology now i was not interested in microbes originally because i was like that's the science you do indoors that's not oh. the science i want to do okay yeah and so i did my whole phd doing both mathematical modeling which can be done outdoors um and also field work on things that you have to go outside to count, like seedlings and small mice that are running away from you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that was in Tucson. And as I was standing sideways to fit into the foot wide shade of a saguaro cactus at noon in the 115 degree heat, I was like, this sucks. <laughs> you know where I need to go next is like freaking Antarctica or something. And I actually had had thought of going to Antarctica years before when I saw internships advertised mm -hmm. and 
I started to think, you know what I'm gonna try to do after graduate school is find a job where I can go to Antarctica. As it happened, my sister had moved to Boulder. So I came up to Colorado to ski and I spent a few extra days in town to talk to professors at CU and just introduce myself, see what they had going on. Mm -hmm. um, definitely tried to get in touch with anyone who was working in Antarctica. And one of them was this really cool scientist named Diana Nemergut. She told me about this cool system of mud puddles on glaciers with microscopic things living in them that are perfect little test tubes for doing ecology. But they're in Antarctica and they're tiny. And <laughs> I was, at the time I was studying these these grasses that live for 20 years and their effect on saguaro cactus and these palo verde trees that live for 200 years probably and mice that can live for probably more than one year and I was seeing this tiny little slice in all of their lives. All of my data would be one little slice of their lives and then I have to model it to figure out what it means. And the idea of an ecosystem with tiny things whose generations might be days or weeks or months where I could invade them and watch these processes the whole life play cycle. out for many generations and see what yeah. happened in real life was really compelling. Cool. So how long from when you conceived of Antarctica being a realistic possibility for you to then actually getting there? How long is that process? It was probably four years or so, which is between the time when, when I actually said, I'm going to start talking to people who work in Antarctica. Maybe they will hire me someday and the time when I flew to Antarctica. I think that's a pretty standard river of suck, actually. <laughs> okay. Did you have any doors closed in your face in that process? Certainly, I talked to a lot of people. Diana was the only one who was willing to give me a chance, and I had a lot of work to do to finish my doctorate research before I could go do that and take mm -hmm. that chance, and that was a tough process. So you actually kind of got a multiple rejections from other people who said no I don't think this would I can I don't think I can help you the uh, yeah I mean those weren't so much formal re rejections as we have a nice conversation about some cool projects that are going on and they're like all right well good luck you know <laughs> there's you know there, there's no possibility there's only one person who said I'm writing a grant to go back there to work on those mud puddles do you want to work with me on that right so it's maybe more like a dead end yes that's a good way to think of it. <laughs> and then the, the can I even finish this PhD? Um, just mental ang mental battle of self-doubt in pushing through some of those difficult skills in that river of suck that <laughs> took a while, too. I think there was a, definitely a period there where every day just wondering, can I do this? Will I ever finish this? And when I say a period there, I mean years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, six years or so. I was trying to do things that I wasn't always good at. And sometimes I found ways around them. Sometimes I found collaborators to help. Sometimes I pushed through and had to learn things that were just hard to learn and just took a lot of work. Do you feel like any of that was ever... Have you heard of imposter syndrome? It's where yes. people... Yeah. Uh, certainly, I think at first, and then later, <laughs> I don't know how much, later as I just got, got up to just me against the work, it was less of an imposter syndrome and me, of, and more of a, uh, more of just actually not being sure that I could actually complete what I was setting out to complete. Um, certainly, I've battled a lot more imposter syndrome since coming to Colorado because I, I got my PhD and then I started this postdoc. And I, I mentioned I jumped sort of sideways in fields. I moved from dealing with data regarding seedlings that I could count or mice that I could track to DNA extracted from a bunch of dirt that represents a community of microbes. There's a whole different, you know, detection biases in that kind of data. There's a whole different way of processing that data, different computer coding skills called bioinformatics for dealing with that kind of data. And I didn't know the first thing about that. And so <laughs> fortunately, I joined a lab group that was really supportive and collaborative and the grad students taught me what I needed to know. And it's definitely humbling when you feel like I'm finally no longer a grad student. I'm the, the postdoc. I'm paid more now. And I <laughs> don't know nearly as much as you guys about what we're doing now. Now, so can you please help me? It's really humbling <laughs> and really hard, and I was really fortunate to have good collaborators who were helpful. 
uh, one one thing I've heard that I liked, maybe I read this on Twitter somewhere. Somebody suggested dealing with imposter syndrome <laughs> by instead of uh, th- just feeling like down that everyone's gonna find out what a fraud you are, think, man, I must be so good to have fooled them all some com- so completely and just try to spin it on its head and turn it into a confidence boost. If any of our listeners haven't heard of imposter syndrome, how, how would you define it? This feeling that I don't know why they accepted me to this program or hired me for this job or how I got here, but like they all clearly think I could do something that I don't know that I can actually do. And they're all going to find out that I'm not up to this task and I'm going to seem like such a fraud for, for saying that I could do it. It's like a lack of believing in oneself, that that you really belong there. Yeah, yeah. But you you do. That you really earn that, that you belong there and (laughs) and deserve that spot there. Right. But looking back, you you did belong there. Yeah. Well, you you were on a path to belonging there. Yeah, I was on a path (laughs) to belonging there. (laughs) Well, and that's that's learning what I needed to to get that done. Right. So I I wonder if a lot of that problem is is from people wishing they were fully developed versions of themselves, but still having to have a job and do things (laughs) along the way that that actually get them to reaching those goals. Yeah, basically. (laughs) I mentioned this really cool scientist that just seemed like everyone she worked with and everything she did was, I mean, people just loved her. She's the one, Diana Nemergat, who gave me a chance to Mm -hmm. do this postdoc that like I was admittedly in some ways very unqualified for because I hadn't worked with DNA data yet. I had to learn it still. Sure. And um, I was super grateful to her for giving me that chance and super excited to work with her. And then she passed away from brain cancer. And yeah, right as I was defending my PhD and preparing to move to to join her in North Carolina, where she had moved by then. And uh, so I reached out to her collaborator on the the project, who I'd never met. I'd just seen his name on an early version of the grant, uh, Steve Schmidt, and said, hey, uh, I was going to go work with Diane on this project. Would you be willing to take over the project and head it up and would you be willing to advise me as a postdoc and like still hire me as a postdoc for this right and he said i don't really want to because you know he'd he'd been working with diana um i think he was her graduate advisor so he'd been working with her for years so he was really hit hard by losing her and he was on sabbatical and he had a bunch of projects going on um, but he said, you can come up to Boulder and we can talk about it, about options. And, um, so I came up to Boulder and met his lab and they let me stick around for a while. And I'm really grateful to Steve for adopting the project and adopting me into his lab. But that certainly uh, did nothing to ease my feelings of imposter syndrome and of really needing to earn a spot in this lab of microbial ecologists when I knew ecology, but not microbes. <laughs> right, but it took a leap of faith yeah. to get here, to, yeah. to, to pursue that. And so it turns out if you ask for things, they might happen. Yeah. And if you don't, you sit there wondering why nothing happens that from your goals. Well, <laughs> did you ask someone to help with them? <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah, cool. That actually um, it really reminds me of, of a conversation I had two days ago. I was working on this really hard new statistical technique. It's hard for me. Somebody else has figured it out and written some nice code in R to make it supposedly easy, but I haven't worked with this data format, so I'm, I'm trying to work out this statistical test that's new for me, and it's a difficult task, and I'm frustrated at how slow it's going. And a professor from down the hall comes in to wash some dishes after a lab event because their half of the building had their water turned off for the day because it's spring break and they didn't think people would be around. And, um, <laughs> and we were like, yeah, wash your dishes. So we're chatting. And I said, yeah, I've, I've, things are going slowly for me. Any suggestions on how to be more productive? And his response was, when things are going slowly, I try to work with somebody else. You know, kind of like you were saying, ask ask for help, but yeah. or even just like just get someone else involved, and it ups the motivation, it ups the um, ideas going back and forth, and the accountability and the teamwork, and gets you more excited about the project. Right. 
not only that, we were talking at dinner. That's actually how this part of how this podcast came to happen is I've been thinking and speaking about these ideas for a long time. I wanted more of a conversation. I wanted I wanted to listen more. Mm-hmm. So here we are. <laughs> Let's talk about the River of Suck. (laughs) The River of Suck is a super wide mythical river churning with whitewater rapids, rocks, and thought piranhas. We can imagine ourselves on one side as our present selves. Behind us is our comfort cave where we can retreat to do things that don't involve risk or growth. On the far side, we can see future versions of ourselves running around doing the things we wish we could do today. You have to suck at something before you can be good at it. Only by diving in and swimming with the thought piranhas can we make it to the other side in agonizingly imperceptible small movements forward towards our impossible-seeming goals. How does one stay mentally strong through the struggle? How do you see the river of suck in your life, Pacifica? In science or in the outdoors? Well, you've talked in previous episodes about there being infinite rivers of suck, right? right? As soon as you get across the shore of one, you can see another one that you want to cross. But the bigger issue for me in some ways is I feel like I crawl out of my little comfort cave and I don't, it's a good thing this is a mythical river because I don't think this would like work from a hydraulics, um, civil engineering perspective, (laughs) but I'm surrounded by a lot of rivers Mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm constantly struggling to decide which one I want to swim across. Right. Um, and like which one I want to invest the energy in really getting across. I can see mm-hmm. distant shores in a lot of directions, which makes it sound like I'm on an island, but clearly I'm not because this is a river metaphor. So Well, no, that that's cool. I mean, <laughs> an island is a lonely place. I mean, if you're trying to cross <laughs> to the other side of the river of suck and all, and you're just stuck on an island and all you can see is infinite ocean and you can't even see the distant land, like, whoa. Right, right, <laughs> right. So, I mean, that's true both in, in science, in my work, and also just in, in life, right? Like, in, like, life, like, in Colorado, we're lucky enough to have, this is good climbing season at, like, Shelf Road, which is a limestone canyon a little south of here, as well as, mm-hmm. like, good climbing season in, like, the deserts of Utah, but it's also still good skiing season, just getting into spring season, spring skiing. Oh, like, yeah. Those are things that I love to do and skills that I'm always trying to improve at, and so, you know, oh, which way do I invest my time um, this weekend kind of questions. Whereas also in science, there's there are usually a lot of questions opening up in front of you, a lot of different skills you could learn and, to, and apply to, these, to answer these different questions. And choosing which rivers to swim is something that's, um, I guess, a really good problem to have, mm-hmm. to have all those ideas of places you want to go. But if everything requires effort to do it to the extent that you really want to, then there's only so many rivers you can swim and actually get somewhere. So it's kind of about yeah. picking your battles for wh- which battles will you actually really be able to cross? Yeah. And yeah. which which will motivate you to continue swimming when things are really difficult? Yeah. <laughs> So let's talk about mistakes. <laughs> mistakes and failure. From what I understand, people don't like making mistakes or failing. And I think there's a lot of instances where people talk about, oh, you don't know how many times I failed before I got where I was. But failure and mistakes mean different things to different people. So can experiments fail? What is failure? And, like, what are mistakes to you? (laughs) Okay. Well, I think on our previous episode, you talked about negative results. So that's an instance where um, an experiment maybe doesn't turn out like you thought, or it gives you a sort of uninteresting result. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you're trying to make something happen, and, oh, whatever I did then didn't make it happen. So, okay, that's, you know, in some ways that's a failure. So negative results are one thing where you you test a hypothesis Mm -hmm. and it turns out to be sort of the uninteresting answer. But (laughs) I think you can also have mistakes in experiments. They they always tell you something, just not maybe what you hoped to know or or something interesting. So you you can make a mistake in setting up your experiment where you put a certain amount of water on 
seeds, so they germinate. Right. And you put the same amount of water on the seeds before, and they germinated, and you learned something about how they grew with and without an invasive grass, in my case. And then you try to repeat this experiment under slightly different conditions, and the seeds don't even germinate. And what you learned was the seeds need a higher humidity to germinate at that amount of water. But that's not really that interesting of a result because, <laughs> like, you, I don't know, you didn't need to put that much effort in to figure that out when you had actually designed this experiment to learn how an invasive grass affected those seedlings after they germinated. But you could, in theory, have spent a crazy amount of time getting to that negative result. Yeah, spend a lot of effort to find out that plants need water. And you're like, cool. <laughs> well, I mean, you can say that's a negative result and that, you know, you would learn something from every experiment, but boy, that that amount of effort was not worth the grand new insight I gained that plants need water. <laughs> so then you're sort of back up where you started. When I fail at, like, a practice thing and I have a goal and it still seems really far off, and I'm just not any closer. That That's maybe a moment to reflect and think about where do I really want to go. Yeah, and so one of the skills that I've learned that I need to use, and I, and I think this is sort of like one of those meta skills. Um, <laughs> so this is like a meta river of the mythical rivers that I want to swim. Okay, yeah. Um, is the learning how to strategically beta test things just to make sure that like, I didn't think the humidity was that different on this second experiment, but it turns out it was, and that it was different enough to make a difference. I need to remember to really include a lot of beta testing, so I just germinate a small number of those seeds instead of going to all the effort to set up that whole thing. Just do a few of them just to make sure seeds still germinate at the amount of water you thought they'd germinate at. So just learning how to beta test experiments every step of the way. So it's kind of this, this meta skill of like learning how to, I don't know, stick my toe in the river and gauge how fast it's rushing to decide how much effort it'll be to swim that and if I'll actually get there. Do you dive in or do you walk in slowly, adjusting to the temperature? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) One of the rivers I'm swimming is learning how to walk slowly into a river before deciding whether to dive in. (laughs) So maybe diving right in isn't (laughs) always the right idea. All right, yeah. Well, also, because you spend so much effort getting back to the shore when that river doesn't work out. Totally. I don't know. Sometimes there's little offshoot streams mm. that diverge from the main path. Yeah. And then they either go somewhere else and land you in a bunch of weeds. Yeah. Or they might come back. Let's say you were on a raft. You might not know if you don't know the river that well. And if it's a mythical river, you don't know what the other side is. There's no way to see. You don't know if you're going to end up in the weeds or, back, or, or way downstream hoping everything's cool. Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How do you keep a good attitude when the science feels hopeless? So one of, one of the things I actually learned in the last year or two as a postdoc as I've I've been investing more in productivity strategies just Mm -hmm. I used to try to just work really hard and hope that would pay off so smarter working yeah trying to work smarter um and one of the things that I learned that comes out of actually extensive research on productivity is and I forget how this is phrased in the original um, research, but you want to try to have a playful attitude towards whatever you're doing. Avoid emotional extremes, I believe is the way it was put. It's very sort of Zen or Jedi, but just try not to get too emotionally invested and have too many emotional extremes about your work, but keep a light, detached, playful mind, and then you never get sort of that anxiety blockage. Anxiety blockage. Anxiety blockage. Having that detachment helps to lessen the blow when things don't go like you hoped. Yeah. So when and when it just seems hopeless, and having perspective helps. So doing things outside of <laughs> science, like climbing. Right. One thing I take away from climbing is whenever I'm in a really scary talk 
like I'm nervous about a talk I'm gonna give or a test I'm gonna take mm -hmm. or I just got a horribly mean rejection letter from a reviewer <laughs> for a manuscript. <laughs> I can be like, you know what? I'm not gonna fall to my death right now as a result of this. Oh, it's yeah. really not a big deal. Do you find any breakthroughs for your scientific thought when you're exercising? I think taking time away from it and letting thoughts percolate in your subconscious Ooh. is important. I think just sometimes even not consciously thinking about it, but letting, at least for me, I'm, I'm pretty invested in and interested and excited about what I'm doing. Even when I'm not thinking about it consciously, it's kind of in my subconscious and an idea will come up out of nowhere. It was my subconscious working on it, I guess, as I'm outside doing something else. Huh, well, maybe I could do it that way. Cool, I'll think about that when I get back and to work in. <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it really doesn't. I think the hardest thing in science is really figuring out what the question is. You know, just like in okay. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, the where like the answer was easy, the real like problem that like the whole earth was built as a calculator to yeah. figure out is like what's the question? Like that's that's kind of science where it's like the hardest part of it in my opinion is figuring out the right question to ask. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to write a grant proposal right now to keep working on microbes in Antarctica, keep studying them. And there are so many questions that I have, but trying to figure out how to frame them in one big overarching question that branches into many little sub-questions that we lead to clear hypotheses is actually really difficult to crystallize for me. Trying to be patient, letting my subconscious work on it, mm -hmm. and then working with other people, talking it out with other people like we were talking about are the two ways I'm trying to approach it. You're constantly having to advocate for yourself to say what I'm doing is important and I need you to believe in me. Yeah, I need you to give me money to do this, <laughs> to sequence this DNA. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> but a lot of people won't advocate for themselves. Have you ever had trouble feeling like you should advocate for yourself or wondering why you're there? Yeah, all the time. I think it's helpful, though, to hear that even though it sounds externally like your story is constantly advocating for yourself, that you still struggle with that element. Should you be doing it? Should I be asking this person? Am I bothering them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you're, so you're struggling with that at the same time you're doing it. Yeah. Is that not the river of suck? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's a good way to think about that. I'm hopefully getting better at it even if it doesn't get less difficult or less painful sometimes. There's a certain rush that I get when it's successful. It's like almost like its own feeling that I'm striving for, like the feeling of success. I got a gig. Oh, these people are interested in what I do, and they believe in what I have to say, and that's really cool. So that's much different from sitting there with a blank calendar going, oh, God. <laughs> what am I going to do? So part of it is that actually that blank calendar motivates me because I don't actually have a choice. I can either go out and advocate for myself or I won't get as much money from jobs and then I won't be able to pay rent and I won't be able to eat food and I won't be able to do the things I love to do, like go out and go skiing and, you know, be a person, not just a musician. <laughs> well, that's the start of the Joseph Campbell hero's journey, right? Is the reluctant hero is forced out of their comfort cave by some external factor before <laughs> descending into the river of suck and ultimately conquering it. Yes! <laughs> you can join the River of Suck swim team and gain instant access to bonus content for just $1 a month. For episode four, this includes extended interviews and outtakes, as well as MP3s of the music you've been hearing, which I composed and performed specifically for this episode. Joining the swim team at riverofsuck.com also gives you the opportunity to interact, leave comments, ask questions of future guests, and truly helps support the creation of this podcast. Let's talk about Antarctica. 
I had a friend whose dad was a geologist in Antarctica and he gave me a signed copy of his dad's book of <laughs> pictures and I I still have it like displayed on my mantle. It was kind of like this like this dream and motivational image for me. I, I spent three months there and then the next year two months and then this last year almost four months. So and it, there's a, a really unique community of people who go there to do research and to support that research because it takes a lot of logistics to support it and it's a unique and, and lovely and supportive community there. I'm just trying to visualize this landscape, yeah. right? Yeah. So you're in the dirt. That's in this actually valley the, between mountains. Just the, picture dry dirt, no plants. Right. You're studying microbial ecosystems through cryo holes. Yeah. <laughs> what does any of that mean? Yeah. <laughs> so cryokinite hole is a fancy word for a mud puddle on a glacier. Oh. So I call them cryo holes for short. So when when this dirt on the glacier collects in a little divot, a little sun cup, it absorbs heat because it's dark colored. So just like wearing a black t-shirt on a sunny day is hotter than wearing a white t-shirt. Mm-hmm. Uh, that dark colored dirt will start to absorb sunlight, get warmer, and it melts the ice under it. So it melts in about a foot into the ice. (laughs) And that dirt that blew onto the glacier has bacteria in it. And not just bacteria, but bacteria that can do photosynthesis, like plants. Those are called cyanobacteria. Cool. And actual algae, and which is like pond scum, right? Yeah. And then microscopic animals called water bears or tardigrade is their more technical name. Um, and other microscopic <laughs> animals called rotifers. And um, so there's entire little food webs and ecosystems within this dirt, but they don't grow very much if they don't have water because most of life on Earth needs water. That's why we're always looking for water in places like Mars to find out if there could be life. Right. And so <laughs> once you have this dirt on ice and it starts melting in, now you have liquid water and these things can start to grow and you actually get quite the little biodigester with a lot of growth in these ecosystems. This is a podcast and we don't have all that much visual content, <laughs> but if you have Google, Google image water bears. <laughs> yeah, they're cool. They're really, and you know what? They're cuter than they look on Google Image. Google oh, really? Image, they look kind of like a weird rhinoceros. <laughs> if you see them under the microscope, squirming around like a cat in a sunbeam, just like running in place as fast as they can and pr- going nowhere, it's like they're trying to swim across a river of suck and just like making <laughs> no progress. They're so much cuter than those electron microscopy photos. Like on they're trying Google. really hard. It's just yes. not working. Yes. That's <laughs> always how they look. If you give the water bears some auger, then they don't just slip on the smooth glass. And then they walk like a little bear. They just like trundle along. But on with eight their, legs. On eight legs. <laughs> it's so cute. And then they rear up on their back legs and they like look around. And then they go back down and keep walking. I wanted to, to bring in something I actually could contribute to this project that I knew how to do. And that was count things and things you can count in in the cryo holes include water bears (laughs) not much else yeah anyway i wanted to do an experiment with tardigrades because that's how i know how to do ecology is to count things if you are googling tardigrades right now which is another word for water bear you're gonna find a lot of articles about the indestructible tardigrade and they, they always make it sound like really epic, like the indestructible tardigrade has survived five mass extinctions on Earth. I will say, though, um, in the spirit of getting across the river of suck that I've come a long way mm-hmm. in being able to grow water bears in the lab. And that is in part due to that strategy we were talking about of get other people involved. Mm-hmm. We've got a couple of students involved um, who are undergraduate students that were helping out in the lab. Um, and... They have done an amazing job at getting reproducing populations of tardigrades to grow in the fridge. Why should anyone care about them? Yeah. Um, Okay. First of all, tardigrades are just cute. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> but more, <laughs> more specifically, um, the question that my research is trying to ask is not actually about just like what happens to tardigrades and mud puddles. <laughs> the question that my research is trying to ask is how random are bacterial ecosystems? So what we do wow. is we create our own little mud puddles on the glacier and we control what goes in and then we can watch how they develop. We're testing some very specific hypotheses about the kinds of randomness in mm -hmm. ecosystem development. And that's important to figure out because we have bacterial ecosystems that do a lot of things for us. They live inside us and help us digest our food. Mm -hmm. They live in the soils with our crops and help our crops grow. They live in the soils with our forests, help our forests stay healthy and create right. lumber and not burn down and burn our houses down. Um, so we'd like to know how random ecosystems are, particularly bacterial ones, so that we can better manage them. And this is a really compelling system to be able to test some of those ideas because it's hard to do ethical experiments on people's guts. What are some of the challenges of living down there and trying to get work done I guess, both in a kind of the physical environment, but also as a team where, yeah, I'm guessing you don't always get to choose the team. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's um, a very relevant question to, I think, a lot of teams down there. I certainly our first season, um, there was some disagreement. So there were three of us. Um, that spent the whole three months down there. And then a few other members of the team spent some subset of that with us. And um, we were all from the same lab in Colorado. These are some of the lovely people who had taught me everything I know about how mm -hmm. to work with DNA. But some of them had different ideas about uh, schedules. Some people being more night owls, some people being more um, early morning um, people. And that ended up resulting in situations where we had where some people's expectations of each other were not being said explicitly, but were being held and they were being held to a so other people were being held to standards that you know, and myself in included is very guilty of being part of the situation. Hold there were frustrating dynamics going on where some people would be would kind of make a plan, someone else would come in later have very good ideas that we wished we could have incorporated earlier, but it was incredibly frustrating to have them thrown in at the last minute after we had set everything up. Um, learning how to deal with that and how to talk about that with each other, talk through that and make, make a plan uh, was, was a struggle. And we were all professional and all um, worked really hard at the communication and we all stayed engaged and had a really successful season. I, I know there are situations with science teams, sometimes they make the news, sometimes they don't, um, <laughs> where that's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking that, about the you, ruining the book endings news story. Did you see that oh, last no. November? There, are no. two, there was a, a Russian station where a couple of guys who had been working together there for Sabotaged a the long data. time. No, they'd... They had been working there for over a year together, I think, and one of them kept ruining the endings of books for the other, and the oh. other eventually stabbed him, and he had to be oh. evacuated. That was in in the news. That's all oh, I know oh, about only that. Only in Antarctica, right? <laughs> so that that became an instant. Uh, that happened, yeah, shortly before I went down to the ice this last time. So Whoa. it was <laughs> fresh in all of our minds to leave the endings of books alone for each other. Fair enough. <laughs> What, so what about the harsh environment element? If you're stuck somewhere, does that wear on your mental state? Yeah, sure. So at the field camp I work at, it's a pretty cush field camp as field camps glamping. go. Very glamping. We are helicopter supported. So we ride in a helicopter from the uh, McMurdo Research Station that we base out of to our field camp. And that means that we are not severely weight limited. I mean, to some degree, obviously, yes, but mm -hmm. helicopters can carry a lot more than I would take on my back. So for somebody who sure. likes backpacking, helicopter camping um, feels very luxurious. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you have your tent and your tent, you know, you, you can have your own tent, which is really nice to be away from people there if you spend the rest of your day so you're, with them. you're not in a building. Correct. We're sleeping sleep. in tents there. Um, but then we have a cook hut. So at the, the camp I work at, 
Many research teams use it, and there's actually a semi-permanent uh, or like a temporary building structure there mm-hmm. that serves as a cook hut. Mm-hmm. And we actually have like a gas range stove in there and a table. And so it's really nice. Um, it's a nice place to hang out, get warm, make food. We um, also, you know, that's that's where everyone is. So if you're trying to get some work done, you're in there. <laughs> if you're playing cards and drinking, you're in there, you know. Um, mm-hmm. So that's one of the challenges of getting work done is when you want to get something done and other folks are getting rowdy, Not, yeah. um, <laughs> that can be distracting. Headphones and earbuds, one of the greatest inventions of all time for that kind of situation. Sure. How do you manage feelings? Because emotions can be really strong. Yeah. Well, um, so one way, like I mentioned earlier, is to have outlets, to get outside, Mm -hmm. to have perspective. Um, Another way is to be talking about it with people. So that's another reason I think this podcast is great, is talking about all these issues and feelings. And I have two friends from grad school that... Um, we email each other at least weekly and sometimes daily our to-do lists. Oh. This started out as we were our, we were accountability buddies for each other, <laughs> and we were um, sending each other to-do lists to help us organize our own time. This was our first steps towards managing our productivity. And our problem with our to-do lists, if we didn't share them with someone, was not that we wouldn't try hard, but that we would put so many things on them that we would feel like such utter failures when we accomplished only perhaps a realistic fraction of those things. Mm -hmm. So the exercise of sending each other our to-do lists was actually more about passing the red face test of, are you really going, expecting to like do all that today? (laughs) Yeah. Um, And, but it's turned into so much more than just to-do list check-ins it's just constant check-ins more about like emotional and challenges that were going on and so i mean it's kind of it's like a it's your part of your support team yeah yeah i've heard people call it peer mentoring yeah or, but i think that's a really important way to help manage emotions and expectations when it is a way of getting of sharing to realize other people have failures and get rejected and get right. frustrated too so i recently learned that what you started talking about there is actually verbal processing and i found out that i'm yeah. a verbal processor <laughs> so this is <laughs> great you're I... finally fulfilling your <laughs> your destiny in podcasting well that's what this is about the yeah. river of suck it's about talking about uncomfortable feelings. Well, do you think I'd be here if I didn't experience these un- uncomfortable feelings? Of course I do. So that's why it's been so good to talk about it in public and with other people. So. Well, and I think the, the <laughs> thought piranhas that you talk about, yeah, those negative thoughts that just come up and bite you, mm-hmm. they seem, at least for me, really not to like light. They. Oh. Um, this is actually the secret to... to growing tardigrades in the lab by the way was to like put them in the dark refrigerator and i feel like the thought piranhas also thrive in the darkness and when i bring them out into the light of the day by emailing them to these two other scientists who are at a similar career stage who very much know what i'm going through because they're going through the same things yeah the the thought piranhas lose a lot of their teeth like you just kind of look at it and you're like wait that's stupid like that's that's not a realistic like fear or like oh it sounds so silly when i say that because of course i'm better than that it gives you a lot of perspective so we need to send the thought piranhas to the dentist yeah have have their teeth extracted (laughs) yeah or just shine a bright light on them and you know i love that that they just sort of wither (laughs) when you have thought water bears of course yeah what are some examples of thought water bears or thought piranhas that that show up in your head you shine the light on and move on Things like, oh, this other person started graduate school at the same time as me, and they're already a professor on, with a tenure track job. So comparing myself to other people, and this is similar to what I yeah. hear people talk about in the age of social media, where you only see other people's highlight reels, and you're always comparing yourself to them. Mm-hmm. So I try not to get sucked into that because um, it's right. not, not productive, and academia is not a race. So it really doesn't matter what they're doing or what I'm doing. I'm doing me. Yeah. Um, but that's the kind of thought that can 
definitely drag at me and drag at my self-esteem. And I'm sure you've heard of the Shackleton situation. Yes, and I read the book Endurance with yeah. several perspectives, accounts of, of I mean, that. you want to talk about River of Suck, that was the whole continent of Suck. Yeah, <laughs> that was 814 miles of ocean of Suck to hit a one a, like one square mile island in the middle of that ocean yeah. with like two days of sun to judge their position with the sextant suck. Like, <laughs> it's a, it's, I mean, that's one of the most inspiring stories. And um, I think Shackleton gets a lot of credit for his leadership skills. That's something that comes through in the book is the way he made such an effort to keep people occupied, to keep their morale up, to... Yeah make the obnoxious people like keep the obnoxious people close to him so that other people didn't have to deal with them i became really interested in this story last summer oh cool and at my music camp rustic roots we used a composition class to write a song about the shackleton expedition leonard hussey was the ship's meteorologist but he was also a banjo player and many of the crew members credit his banjo playing to their continued grasp on sanity cool that's really cool <laughs> so, so perhaps that will be the musical feature at, towards the end of the podcast sweet <laughs> adventure danger almost certain death but we'll be a hero if you ever make it back how could we know who'd pull us through? It was Leonard picking on the banjo. Ha, see, say us a song. Tune your banjo one more time. The only thing that pulled us through was Leonard picking on the banjo. Ship is sinking. Crushed by the ice, Shackleton pulled out his gun and shot the poor old cat. Each man save a pound or two, and Leonard, bring your banjo. A sea, play us a song, to that banjo one more time. The only thing that pulled us through was Leonard picking on the banjo. It fell apart. Load the sleds and mush the dogs, or else we will be dead. We must get to solid ground. And Leonard, don't forget the banjo. A sea, play us a song. Do that banjo one more time. The only thing that pulled us through was Leonard picking on a banjo. Boats now, there is little room, not much food and not much drink, and we bail all day. Heading where we think there's land with a song from Leonard's banjo. A sea, play us a song, to that banjo one more time. The only thing that pulled us through was Leonard picking on the banjo. Island, seal, and penguin lunch. Sleeping bags are frozen and our coats are plates of ice. Doubtful we can hold out long. Oh, Leonard, pick up your banjo. A sea, play us a song. Tune that banjo one more time. The only thing that pulled us through was Leonard picking on the banjo. Shackleton and five men sailed off in a boat. All our hopes are pinned on them, pray God she stays afloat. <laughs> months and months we camped in cold with nothing but the picking of the banjo. A sea, play us a song. Tune that banjo one more time. The only thing that pulled us through was better picking on the banjo. A 
then one morning Tommy saw a ship Toorooloo and now we know that we are going home It was Leonard pulled us through But I never want to hear another banjo Must he play us a song to that banjo one more time The only thing that pulled us through was Leonard picking on the banjo You have a blog mm -hmm. and we can follow your work in fact we can look at what you've been doing and we can follow you as you continue down your awesome path of investigating environments and ecosystems and microbes. How do we stay in touch? How do we see what, what you're up to? Uh, you can see what we have been up to. I say we, the field team that I've been working with mm -hmm. in Antarctica at cryoholes.wordpress.com. And you can follow what I'm going to do in the future. If you go to pacificasummers.com, um, you can find my blog on there and a little like about my research. And hopefully that will keep getting updated as I do new cool things in the future. Yeah. And if you're not sure how to spell Pacifica Summers, look at the title of this podcast <laughs> on your screen right now. Yeah. And I love going out and talking to groups in schools and doing, you know, getting getting out of the lab and talking to other people about what I do. So if you are at a school or somewhere else and trying to find out more about how to connect with scientists, you can find out how to get in touch with me on there. Cool. That's awesome. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Thanks this for being cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for being here. It's been really fun to hang out. <laughs> It has been fun. <laughs> I don't usually get to talk about all the ways I've failed and messed up. I just talk about that time I went to Antarctica and it was awesome. Oh, yeah. So it's it's cool to get to talk about the times when I sat in a underground lab with no cell phone service and <laughs> thought I was failing <laughs> every day <laughs> and failed until I didn't fail. <laughs> Please consider giving a rating or reviewing River of Suck on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Tell your friends and help spread the word. Tell one friend. Tell a friend to tell a friend. No one ever said crossing the River of Suck would be easy or comfortable. So I want to thank you for tuning in and giving it a chance. The music in this episode was composed and performed by me, Andy Reiner. I'll be back with a new episode every month, forever, so make sure to subscribe wherever you listen. Visit riverofsuck.com for all the latest updates on future episodes and guests. Become a member of the River of Suck swim team to support this podcast and access exclusive content, extended interviews, and high-quality downloads of music recorded for this podcast. My name is Andy Reiner. Till next time, keep swimming! <laughs>